I will, but after it, after this, right? Okay. Let's see. It says jazz and open. Yeah. Nothing is too difficult for thee. Ah, Lord God, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power. Ah, Lord God, thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thine outstretched arms. Nothing is too difficult for thee. Nothing is too difficult for thee. Great mighty God, great in counsel and mighty in deed. Nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing, nothing is too difficult for thee. Hi there, welcome today. I'm so glad you're here. And just in case you're wondering, this is not our normal. Okay, it's not even a new normal, it's just different. And we welcome you to God's Galaxy. They just put some wonderful stuff up here. And Ben's going to give some uh, uh, welcoming, welcoming. <laughs> Aliens. Glad to know that. Hey, in case you had your eyes closed the whole time, we have BBS going on today, tomorrow, and two days after that. So it's the next four nights. Um, if you have kids or grandkids that aren't pre-registered, it's not a big deal. Uh, just still bring them, and we'll get them uh, scheduled in there. And it's from 6 to 8. If you, listen real quick, if you are a volunteer in any capacity for VBS, just a reminder to be here at 530 uh, each night. So uh, make sure to uh, do that. I think that's it. I was getting hand signals from somebody. Okay. Uh, I think that's it. Hey, we're super excited you're here today. Um, I'm pumped to worship Jesus with you together this morning. So uh, let's continue in song after this prayer. Dear Lord, uh, I just thank you for everyone that, that made today a priority to say, man, whatever's going on in my life, I have a reason to be grateful and thankful because of the hope and the faith that I have. In Jesus Christ, God's Son, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, what Jesus did for us all those years ago, counting himself less, emptying himself, as Philippians 2 says, to the point of death, not just any kind of death, but the most torturous, horrific death, even death on a cross. So, Lord, we give you praise for your son, Jesus, and what he's done on our behalf. It's in his name we pray. Amen. If you are visiting or have not been here for a while and want, there's some cards in the back of the tape, whatever, in front of you, please fill one out and feel free to put it in the offering box so we can, uh, you know, acknowledge that somehow. And if you are, um, if you're in SAS or you want to be in SAS, and if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it today. <laughs> But if you could meet at three today, if you'd like to, and hopefully it'll be quick and easy. Okay, um, short and sweet. Sorry, that's what sass is. Okay, anyway, <laughs> we had a few suggestions, so we're going to do some old hymns today. If you don't like that, don't worry, it will change. If you do like that, sing really, really loud. Okay, let's see. I'll have you stand up, please. please. <laughs> Some glad morning when this life is over, I fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. Wind 
the shadows of his life have grown up like waves, like a bird from prison bars has flown some great voices out there this morning. Victory in Jesus. We have victory. Oh, by the way, we kind of picked a few of these to, to kind of coincide with um, the Catching Bible School. And so um, if you come every night, you'll figure out which one goes with which. How's that? Okay, let's see. Let's see. seated it's coming time to communion song uh, communion time and uh, the last night especially we're going to be talking about grace and the simple old hymn most of you probably were sung to it by mom in when she was rocking you so sing it like you mean it how's that <laughs> Days 
to sing God's praise than when we first Good morning. You know, we come to that real precious time now of communion. And really, it's really important as a church we can come together and cast aside and forget about the cares of the world and the problems we might have. And to look at the love that God gave us and the sacrifice that Jesus made. When you take that bread this morning, if you remember Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took that bread and gave thanks. And then he broke it and said, this is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Just think about that. His broken body was done for me and for you. When he was beaten almost to death before he was crucified, his body was beaten. It was beaten when that crown of thorns was shoved upon his head. It was beaten when he had those nails into his hands and into his feet. And when that spear went into his side. And he said he did that for you and me. And why he did that? So he shed his blood. Because it's through his blood that our sins are forgiven. Then he took that cup and said that this is a New Testament in my blood. The new contract. The new agreement. That if we confess our sins to him, he'll forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And this morning when we take that bread and that cup. We need to remember our sins weren't paid for with silver. Our sins weren't paid for with gold. And our sins weren't paid for because... Maybe in our family, we had so many good Christian people. Our sins were paid for by the precious blood of Jesus, without blemish and without spot. Years ago, so people would remember how important this was, the Knight Templars had a little message that said, look around. If you look very hard, you'll see that change and decay is written on the face of everything. And really, the cradle and the coffin stand side by side because the moment you begin to live, that moment also you begin to die but thanks be to jesus christ who said we can now say grave or death where is thy sting grave where is thy victory our victory was given to us by god by sending his son jesus christ to die upon that cross the same jesus we're going to think about today as we take communion let's pray our dear most gracious heavenly father we thank you for all the blessings you've bestowed upon us we thank you for taking that beating and going to that cross so that our sins would be forgiven. We ask that you would clear all of our minds of the thoughts and things of the world right now and let us remember how important you are and how faithful God is to love us as much as he does. Be with us. Continue to lead, guide, and direct us through our life. We do pray it in the name of our Savior and your Son, Jesus. Amen.
Hey, good morning, church. Great to be back with you guys this Sunday. Kids, you can head back to Children's Church. And uh, for those of us staying in here, go ahead and open your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4. That's where we're going to be at. Uh, we saw a new sermon series this week. As you can see behind me, an interesting graphic. Uh, probably a word you probably never thought was uh, one in the Bible and number two would ever be talked about in church. That's the word gangrene. It's an interesting word uh, in the Greek. It actually only happens one time uh, throughout Scripture. And it's in our passage today, 2 Timothy chapter 4. So go ahead, or 2 rather, 14 to 19. Uh, so I, I, I was thinking about that verse in particular. And as you will see, that word gangrene is a metaphorical term of that, that there was this cancerous spiritual disease within the church at Ephesus where Timothy was pastoring that Paul's writing this letter to. And that needs to do something about it. As you know, gangrene, you can't just let that spread all over your body. Something needs to be done about that. And in some cases, people with gangrene sometimes have to get different parts of their body amputated. Uh, that, it's that drastic of a measure. And so uh, for the next four weeks, we're, we're looking at this sermon series, Gangrene, Treating Toxic Traits. And what we see in our passage where the word gangrene is actually specifically mentioned is this idea, of, kind of twofold idea of false teachers and spiritual abuse. Uh, and unless you've been living under a rock, you, you know that that is still a problem today in the church, sadly. Sad but true. So let's read through this and hopefully I, we can understand why spiritual abusers do what they do, uh, what the cause of that is, what the effect is on the church body and the world's reputation of what they think about the church, what we should do to spiritual abusers, and finally, a word of hope uh, through a gospel lens on spiritual abuse. So read this with me, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 to, and following. Paul says to Timothy, He's ministering at the church in Ephesus. He says, remind them of these things, these things he just got done talking about, namely verses 11 through 13, this good news about Jesus. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel, quarrel about words, which does no good but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. And here it is. Their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. The reason that spiritual abuse and false teachers is even a category of a demographic of people is because there are personal agendas with false teachers, there are ulterior motives, and there is a different end game for those who practice spiritual abuse. And so that leads me to this first observation. Why do spiritual abusers do what they do? Spiritual abusers twist the truth for a personal agenda. This is what they've been doing ever since this time, and I suppose even into the Old Testament time as well. That from the beginning, this is what happens, is the reason that spiritual abusers and false teachers even have authority to speak into people's lives is because it's people they trust, they know, that probably have some, maybe even a Bible degree, you know, or probably staff at a church in most cases. And, and so they have a wealth of biblical knowledge and they take that biblical truth or they take verses out of context and they will twist it and frame it in a way that benefits them personally for some agenda that they may have. So Paul is writing. He write, This is 2 Timothy. He's already written 1 Timothy. He writes 1 and 2 Timothy to Timothy to encourage him to endure hardships, to fulfill his ministry. And then he gives an example of two ministers that failed that cause. As you see there in verse 17, the gangrene verse, Hymenaeus and Philetus. It says in verse 18, talking about twisting the truth, Paul says... To Timothy, these guys, in verse 18, 
they have what from the truth? They've swerved off the road, right? So it's to say that they were truthful for a time, that they were going down truth uh, Avenue. Man, I was trying to think of like a T Boulevard court. There's no T that I can think of. They were going down the way of truth for a while. And then they swerved off, he says, because they had their own agendas to fulfill, whatever those may be. If you will, just flip a page backwards, probably maybe two pages. Look at 1 Timothy 6, verses 3 to 6. Paul here, in his first letter to Timothy, was navigating this topic of false teachers and spiritual abusers. He says in 1 Timothy 6, verse 3 and following, If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. So these people are preying on people that are already mixed up, right? It says they're depraved in mind, they're depraved of the truth because they're getting the slanted half-truths, the twisted truth from these false people. Then come back to 2 Timothy, look at chapter 3, verses 5 to 9. I mean, Paul is just hammering this topic all throughout these two epistles that he writes to Timothy. Huge problem in Ephesus. 2 Timothy 3, 5 to 9, he says, some of these people have the appearance of godliness, but they deny its power. Avoid these kinds of people, such people. Verse 6 in 2 Timothy 3, for among them are those who creep into households, capture weak women, burdened with sins, and led astray by various passions, always learning and able, never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres oppose Moses, traditionally those guys are the names of Pharaoh's magicians during the plagues, right? That counterfeited plagues for a while. That's who he's referencing there. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also oppose the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get very far, for their folly will be made plain to all as what that of those two men. So Paul just hitting away that there are people all over this church in Ephesus and in the city that are twisting truth, twisting biblical truth for a personal agenda. Come back to our text in 2 Timothy 2, in verse 14, he says, don't quarrel about words. So one commentary I read said that Paul probably coined this word in the Greek. It's laga maheo. And that means that they, there was a divided debate. That it's fighting with words. Thank God that that doesn't happen today, right? Yeah, laga maheo. That still happens today. He says, avoid this irreverent babble, verse 16. You know, he just, he keeps hammering away at these same Topics And the danger with spiritual abusers and false teachers, as Jesus even said in the Sermon on the Mount, is that these are people within the church, not outside, right? That's really the scary thing is that these people exist for a long time on the inside. Not, it's not that we got to be careful of all these worldly people, but it's saying there's wolves in sheep's clothing to quote what Jesus said about false teachers, spiritual abusers. And that's really the scary thing here. Check out what Peter had to say on this topic. In 2 Peter 2, 1 through 3, he says, False prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality because of them. The way of truth will be blasphemed. In their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep as, it, as to say that there is an end coming to this eventually. And so you might be saying, well, are we talking about spiritual abusers or false teachers today? Because maybe we think of that in two different categories, but I'm arguing today that they're synonymous, right? Because a false teacher and a spiritual abuser, what they both have, the false teacher exploits Christians with God's word and, and a Christian background and spiritual abusers exploit Christians with a Christian background and God's word. They both do the same thing. They do it in different ways, but it's the same thing. 
twisting truth is taking partial truth and mixing it to have a worldly sinful motive. Think about even Satan himself in Matthew 4, when Jesus is tempted after 40 days of fasting in the wilderness. And what happens? Satan comes to him and it's, Satan doesn't just say, hey, do these evil things, but what does he do? He says, hey, Jesus, look at what God's word says and do these things. Satan is maybe the master proof texter of the Bible. He's the master tru twist truther. Try to say that eight times fast. Spiritual abusers will twist the truth for a personal agenda. That's what they do. That's their end game all the time. Now, what is the effect? What's the, the, the effect of spiritual abusers, false teachers being in a church context? Here's the second point today. Spiritual abusers infect and upset the faith of many. This is the inevitable result. This is why Paul says this is like gangrene. This is, this is eating away. This is dead stuff that's eating away healthy stuff. Is when these people are in a church, it's just infecting the rest. It's spreading. It's infecting. And look what he says in verse 18. I mean, I just took that word right out of the text. It says at the end of verse 18c, they are upsetting. That is they, Hymenaeus and Philaetus. They are upsetting the faith of some. I mean, what, what, what is your first reaction when you hear about a sexual abuse scandal in the church? You know, you just demoralized again. It's like, it's just, I mean, live for a, another month and you'll hear another report, I promise. Sad but true, right? And it's, it's demoralizing, it's infuriating, it's confusing. How can people, claim, you know, claim of the name of Christ, live in a Christian way for so long, and then flip this switch that actually they were disingenuous from the beginning? This happens all the time. Flip back in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Hymenaeus has actually already been tagged one time before 2 Timothy. He shows up in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Look at verses 18 to 20 with me. That last paragraph in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul says, This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that, you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are our guy Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. More on that <laughs> last phrase in a little bit. They shipwreck their faith, Paul says. Man, th this is just like, it it's upsetting, it's infectious. The, the serious nature of this, it starts with the false doctrine. Because th when you can get someone indoctrinated the wrong way, then you got them hooked, right? I mean, the point, the point here that's really scary is, you know, I've been here the, like almost eight years now, long time. And probably for most of you that have been with me from the beginning, you would say, man, if Ben said it from the stage, I'm rolling with that. You know, that, I trust that. He's been our shepherd for eight years. You know, ask, ask Ben your Bible question. A lot of you would probably, and that's great to some degree, but that's also scary, right? Because you could I could just be spoon, spoon feeding you anything and, and I could always be opening up to passage and say, see, here it is right here in 1 Timothy 1, verse 20. And, and that's the scary part with false teachers and spiritual abusers is they have this, this talent, this evil, evil way of going about saying, convincing people, indoctrinating people in the wrong way for an evil end. It's interesting here, false doctrine is really the topic that uh, the words sound doctrine, the word sound is actually the word healthy. Uh, take note of this in uh, 2 Timothy 1.13. So just look at the chapter before. 2 Timothy 1.13, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Look at your footnote on the word sound. You might have a footnote there. It, what is the word? It, it's health, healthy. It's the idea of hygiene in the Greek. It, it's that when, when we don't have sound doctrine, it, it's, it's going to be bad health for the church body. Look what he says in 2 Timothy 4 verse 3. Flip your page. He says this time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, healthy teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Isn't that a shame? 
Isn't it a shame that people could just leave here today and say, I don't want to hear the truth. I'm going to go somewhere else where I get my ears itched. You think that happens today still? (laughs) You think people go and identify with different, because there's a million different kinds of churches now in America. And I promise you can find a church that will fit your lifestyle, right? I promise you can find a church in America that will preach everything that your itching ears want to hear and, and, and fix that itch for you. And it's, it, this is a scary thing. I mean, he says this in Ty, the next book after 2 Timothy, when Paul writes to Titus, he says this in Titus 1, 9 and 2, 1. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word is taught so that he may be able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. And then in 2, 1, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. I mean, just Paul hammering away in these pastoral epistles in Timothy and Titus about this problem. Look at verse 14 of 2 Timothy 2 in our text. It says, remind them of these things. Remind them of this sound doctrine, this healthy stuff for their body that's good for consumption. Charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Underline the word ruins. The word ruins in 2 Timothy 2.14, in the Greek is catastrophe. What does that sound like? Catastrophe, right? That when this is happening, when false teachers, spiritual abusers, and no one is doing what he says to Titus, rebuking that and contradicting false teaching with sound teaching, when this is just left wide open and rampant and spreading, he says it's catastrophic. It is a catastrophe. It is ruining many people. It's infecting them. And it is upsetting them. Look at the actual charge that Hymenaeus and Philetus get in verse 18. It says that that what they're doing is like gangrene in the church. But what is it that they are actually doing? Well, Paul says in verse 18 of our text, they've swerved from the truth. And this is what they say to people, their false teaching. The resurrection has already happened. You might say, well, what's the big deal about that? The, the, the resurrection has already happened. Well, I think if I'm understanding this correctly, what they were saying is Jesus didn't literally rise from the dead. It was a spiritual resurrection. And the inevitable byproduct of that teaching is to say, we also won't literally have new resurrected heavenly bodies, but just spiritual resurrected bodies. And the implication of that is that we have no hope for the future. And the implication of that is that if our resurrection is spiritual, not bodily, then we can do with whatever we want with our bodies. You think that was infecting a church? You think that was leading to catastrophe and ruin? I think so. This is what Paul said to the church in Corinth about a real bodily resurrected Jesus. And that means a real bodily resurrection for us as believers in Christ. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins, Paul says. So if you don't believe the opposite, it's no wonder he's calling out Hymenaeus and Philetus for this, right? Because just years ago, he's writing to the church in Corinth saying, this is, this is a staple. If you don't believe this and your Christianity doesn't mean anything at all. Spiritual abusers infect and upset the faith of many. People permanently turned off to Christ and to the church because someone else gave Christ a bad name. That might not be fair, but that's the reality of many people's spiritual state. Here's the third observation today. If, if we know how spiritual abusers operate, if we know the cause that it infects the church, it infects other healthy believers, and it's upsetting the faith of many, then what do we do? What do we do with people like this? Spiritual abusers, thirdly, should be exposed and excommunicated. That's the idea of gangrene, right? I mean, have you ever heard of a person that says, hey, look at this gangrene in my right knee. I'm going to let it kind of hibernate for about six months and see what happens. If someone said that to you, you would be looking at them with like 18 eyes. Like, what? Did, did you get a second consultation? Did you get a second opinion? I mean, who are you, who are you doctoring with? That, that would be insane for somebody to do. Gangrene, if you don't know, is dead skin tissue in a body. And uh, the inevitable byproduct of that is that usually spreads. And in some cases, amputation is needed in that case. So this is the damaging effect of what goes on is that it's hurting the rest of the flock 
So it needs to be exposed. This is who this person is. This is how they operate. This is bad. And then kick them out of the church. When he said what he did in 1 Timothy 1.20, I've handed Hymenaeus and Alexander over to Satan. The same language used in 1 Corinthians 5 for the guy sleeping with his mother-in-law, stepmom, whoever it was. He says, there's a time for excommunication because if this, if this settles in, it's like yeast. This sin is just going to spread into any, anyone and everything, and it needs to be ridden out. Just this week, maybe last, maybe like two weeks ago, the Southern Baptist Church, you know, there was this big exposure on that, you know, of all the sexual abuse that's been. I was reading about that yesterday. And it was interesting that when, when these allegations would come forward from all different parties and people, not only would people not be believed, but they would be stonewalled and they would, in some cases, be uh, treated with just extreme hostility, all in the name of making sure that the church has a good name. Isn't that sad? You want to know the way that we keep the church having a good name is we take sexual abuse seriously. Amen? Anyone with me? I mean, it's, it's crazy when we take false teaching seriously, when we take spiritual abuse of any kind seriously. And let's get this straight. It's not just Southern Baptists. It's not just the Catholic Church. You know, I watched that movie Spotlight when the Boston Globe, you know, exposed the mass corruption globally with the Catholic Church and sex abuse. And not just Southern Baptists, not just Catholic. It's the Christian Church, too. My wife would testify to you, her home church, that she would, had great memories from great indoctrination great years and years spent there uh, they took the route of covering up a sexual abuser they took the route of just like the southern baptists and the catholic churches they covered up they actually persecuted the whistleblowers in their own church so much so that one guy ended up getting terminated from his job at saint Louis christian college because he was trying to shed light on the truth and say this is not okay Man, when we just say, man, that's not good, but we don't act, what good is that? I think the book of James says that, right? Preach that at Oil Belt this week. When we're just hearers of the word and not doers of the word, James says, man, what, what, what good is that? To know that something is corrupt, some abuse situation is happening, and we just don't do anything about it. You want to know an interesting fact? Matter of fact, this just happened to play. I didn't even plan it on purpose. I was doing the CIY training uh, that we need to do for our CIY move trip for the high school week. And there's this sexual abuse training you have to do as a volunteer going to CIY. Great. This is like, you know, 45 minutes long. This is quite a long thing, and it was very informational. But this is what they said in part of that training. You know, sometimes we think the, the phrase stranger danger is a good way to protect our children. Almost as to say... You know, the idea with stranger danger is don't go by the guy with the white van that's parked at the park that has the black trench coat that has candy pouring out of his pockets, right? As if to say that that guy is always at the park 24-7, right? This is what's interesting. They had a stat in there that said this, 90% of children who are sexually abused are abused by someone they know or trust. So this idea of stranger danger is only 10% of people. 10% of abusers abuse people that they don't know. This is why Paul says, get these guys. You know, you might say, do we really need to excommunicate them? You know, I'm almost cussing. You know, I almost had to hold my tongue there. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. It's, it's, it's that dangerous. Is to say, when we see signs of this, mandated reporting is not just saying, I saw a crime happen, but it's saying, I have a suspicion of a crime. It's even the suspicion. That's how the law is interpreted, how it's defined in language, in, in terms, in definition. This is scary stuff. So Paul names eight guys in First and Second Timothy. He names Hymenaeus. He names Alexander. He, name, he names Fuligus. That's a great name. <laughs> He's fooling somebody. Hermogenes, Philetus, Janus, Jambres, and Demas. You might say, man, it's not good. It's not biblical. It's not right to call people out by name from stage or through a letter, through an email, in public conversation. That's inappropriate. Well, you'd be going against what Paul did with eight guys. If you say, well, we shouldn't do that. If, if we're going to avoid people like this, we have to know who they are and identify those people. We should expose 
gangrene and minimize the spread of gangrene by excommunicating it. You know, if you've ever been consulted by a doctor on a disease or something, it would be outrageous for a doctor to say, you know, I, I see something here, but not, I'm not going to tell you exactly what you have. How many of you would be frustrated by that? That'd be bad news or good news? That'd be bad news. You're like, well, you, you know, you go home, you tell your spouse, well, I think there's bad news, but, but no one told me what the bad news, you know, he refused to tell me what the bad news is. And he said, it, it, it's bad, but I'm not going to do anything about it. I, I don't think we should do surgery. We're not going to do procedure. I'm not going to write you a script for Williams Brothers. I'm not going to do any of that. Okay. It's bad, but we're just going to leave it as is. And, and hopefully, hopefully it will get better. Man, we do that too much in the church, don't we? We, we just say, well, I just, I just, man, that's bad, but, but hopefully it'll get better over time. Paul exposes these people in First and Second Timothy, and he says, have nothing to do with these guys. These guys, they're eating away at what is healthy still. Uh, how many of you have ever visited the Statue of Liberty before? Anyone in person seen it up close and personal? Handful of people. Uh, I, I, I want to assume this, but hopefully uh, that everyone's at least seen a picture of the Statue of Liberty, right? <laughs> so even if we haven't seen it, I haven't seen it. It'd be cool to see it up close and personal. But, but all of us, when we think of the Statue of Liberty, you know, we think of you know, her with the crown, with the torch, standing proudly there on the island. And what, what color comes to your mind when you think Statue of Liberty? Yeah, kind of that nasty pale green color, right? Uh, <laughs> and it's like, man, you know, could they have chosen any color? Well, I just found this out this week. It's interesting. It's called verdigris. V-E-R-D-I-G-R-I-S. Verdigris. And it, the Statue of Liberty is actually covered in copper. I don't know if you knew that or not. News to me. <laughs> I'm behind the times. Uh, so the, the Statue of Liberty covered in copper, something shiny, something bright, something pure. Verdigris sets in. It's this green colored thing that, that spreads on copper surfaces when left exposed outside. You think that'll preach? <laughs> this is Paul's example with, with gangrene. Is that it's similar to verdigris. You, you have something pure... You have something shiny, you have something in its purified good state, and over the course of time, when things are getting exposed and there's no treatment to prevent the patinacea, the vertigrease from spreading on this cup. That's why you find pennies on the ground and you know they got the nasty green stuff. It's like that's what it is, vertigree. Vertigrease. And Paul says he makes the same example. He says in the same way, this is exactly what we do when we don't act in the church. What was pure is now unpure. What did have a good reputation now has no reputation in the, in, the, in the face of trying to save reputation. How ironic is that? Claiming the name of Christ while behaving like unbelievers is a surefire way to get you excommunicated, Paul says. Here's, I think, the big idea in all of this. Because at this point, you're probably just demoralized, right? You're like, man, we're just talking about Sex abuse in church, we're talking about uh, spiritual abuse, talking about false teachers, all this bad stuff, people getting excommunicated. Is there any good news today, you might say, to Preacher Ben? And I would say, I think there's one piece of good news. Look at verse 19 with me of our text, the last verse, 2 Timothy 2, 19. After Paul exposes these guys, says what they're doing, it's like gangrene, this is bad, they're upsetting the faith of many. He says this in verse 19, but God's firm foundation, what? Say it louder. Stands. Bearing this seal. And then he quotes two verses in the Old Testament. The Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So look at that first phrase. The Lord knows those who are his. The Lord can distinguish a wolf from a sheep, right? Right? He, he can spot the spiritual abuser, the false teacher, before we even have a thought about it in our head. Second verse, second part of that verse. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. That those of us who are genuine, who are followers of Christ, who love the Lord, who love his people, who want to see protection, who want to see abuse exterminated, who wants to see false teaching exterminated. He says, those of you that are in that category, make sure you depart from these guys. Could you guess where Paul is quoting these two Bible verses from in the Old Testament? 
It's in Numbers 16. Turn there with me as we close out today. Number 16, it's this, uh, the whole, I mean, it's a long chapter. And Paul pulls, basically, and anytime there's verses pulled, you know, from the New Testament, from the old into the new, the idea is not just necessarily that verse by itself, but the whole story behind that verse. And so we have Korah's rebellion here. I just want to read it, just, I'm going to throw out a couple of verses so that you kind of get the large picture here, since it's such big, but it's really worth hearing this today. Numbers 16, verse 2. It says they rose up, these, a whole bunch of guys, the, uh, Dathan and Abiram and Korah. They rose up before Moses, the leader of Israel that God appointed, with a number of the people of Israel, 250 chiefs of the congregation, chosen from the assembly, well-known men. Verses 20 to 21. The Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron saying, separate yourselves from among this congregation that I might consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces and said, oh God, the God of the spirits and of all flesh, shall one man sin and will you be angry with all the congregation? Verse 26. And he spoke to the congregation saying, Moses gives this directive. He says, hey guys, everyone depart please from the tents of these wicked men. Don't touch anything of theirs lest you be swept away with their sins. So God's wrath and judgment coming down on these guys that are going to get what's coming to them. And in the same way that Paul says, hey, get away from Hymenaeus, get away from Alexander, get away from Philetus, get away from these guys. That's what he says right there in verse 26. Get away from these guys. Don't have any contact with them. Then look what happens in verse 32 and 30 through 35 or 31 to 35. As soon as he had finished speaking all these words, the ground underneath these guys split apart. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the people who belonged to Korah and all their goods. So they and all that belonged to them went down alive into Sheol and the earth closed over them and they perished from the midst of the assembly. If your jaw isn't on the ground now, I don't know what will. And all Israel who were around them fled at their cry, for they said, lest the earth swallow us up. And fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men offering the incense. Finally, in verse 41 and 49, 41. But on the next day, all the congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and against Aaron, saying, you have killed the people of the Lord. Verse 49, a plague breaks out because people are still on the wrong side of the camp, spiritually speaking. Opposed to God and his leadership and what he set in place. Verse 49, finally. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700 besides those who died in the affair of Korah. Wow. Do you see the overlap here why Paul referenced number 16 in 2 Timothy 2? Is because people were defined, right, true, genuine, spiritual leadership. They were picking the wrong side. They, they wanted their own end game and not God's end game. They wanted to twist truth in a way that, that benefited them, but not the majority of God's people. And God opens the earth up, literally, and eats them. And it almost as if to say, almost as if God is saying, are there any more questions? If, if number 16 doesn't put the fear of God into you, I don't think much will. That's coming back to this big idea. That's why I say God brought in, that's, I think that's why Paul references number 16. He's saying, just like God brought an end to them, God will bring an end to these guys if they continue in their sin. You know what's interesting is that God said, get away, pick a side. You're either on the right side or the wrong side. And the, right, the wrong side is going to be judged, those who are rebellious, but those who are loyal, God's firm foundation stands. So what Paul says, the same for them is same for us. You know what's interesting in all of this under the topic of spiritual abuse is that Christ was abused by spiritual leaders unto death. Isn't that crazy? You know, we might think, well, this sermon doesn't apply to me, maybe. You might be sitting there saying, what does this have to do with me? Well, spiritual abuse was so flagrant, so egregious, 
so horrifying that it actually got Jesus killed. So this topic, by and large, actually encompasses the gospel message that there is spiritual abuse in the world, that spiritual abusers use their powers politically to their advantage and manipulated laws and customs to get God's son killed on the cross. I know I keep saying I'm almost done. I got to stop saying that. I'm almost done. Turn back with me one last time to our main passage, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 13. I promise I'm done after this. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 13. Because how Paul started our main passage off today, he says, remind them of these things in verse 14. So what's the immediate context of remind them of these things? He says in verse 19, God's firm foundation stands. What can we bank on? What hope can we leave here today? What kind of good news can we leave here with today on this topic? 2 Timothy 2, 11 through 13. The saying is trustworthy. For if we have died with him, Jesus, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. But get this good news. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Too many have sided on the side of corruption and not Christ. You know, when people ask me, man, how can you be a Christian when, when the name of the church is just always getting muddled and dirtied? And you know what I tell people while I'm still rolling with Jesus? As I said, man, I, I, for me personally, I'm going to be at least one person that gives Christ a good name, right? I mean, that's got to, I hope that's your mindset, is to not break off with all these abuse reports and just time after time, bad news coming down the pipe of, man, look at what the church did now, look at this cover-up, look at this scandal, look at the, that's going to be happening until Jesus comes back. But that's the good news here, is that there's a time coming where the abuse will end, that Evil's reign will stop. False teachers will stop. Spiritual abuse will stop. Job, in the midst of his suffering, in Job 19, 25, he says, my redeemer will stand at last on the earth. I have a redeemer who lives. We have a redeemer who's coming back. There's a time coming when there's not going to be any more bad news, any more abuse. So just like the guys in number 16, you have to pick a side. Do I stand on corruption? Do I lead on the side of sweeping things under the rug? Or do I stand with Christ? whose firm foundation stands. Man, that's my invitation to you. Pick a side and stay on that side. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, man, it's, it's hard talking about this topic today. It's heavy. More than likely, it's affected people that are here today in this room. Personally. Um, I hate it. it it's... Messed up a lot of stuff in my own life. It's never fun hearing bad news about the church. But that is the reality of the world that we live in. Is that there are so many people that claim I'm on Christ's side, but they're really on the side of corruption. Lord, I pray that our approach would be I'm going to change Christ's reputation. At least people are going to get a different taste in their mouth when they meet me. When they interact with me, when they see me, when they see how I treat them, when they see what I believe and how I live out what I believe, they are going to see Jesus. May we all live, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me as I follow Christ. We have to take seriously at least our own personal reputation and responsibility that we have bearing Christ's name as a Christian. Lord, if there's anybody in the room during this invitation time that has been mistreated, abused, neglected, uh, marginalized, silenced in some way. Lord, I pray that you would give them a peace that transcends all understanding, that you would bring healing to them today, that you would bring peace, that there would be this hope of this big idea that, that there is a time coming when this abuse will end, when justice will roll like a river, either on that person or through the cross of Christ. Lord, I pray for repentance on behalf of these corrupted people the spiritual abusers that are still operating and not exposed, the false teachers that still have a pulpit and a microphone and an audience. Lord, we pray for exposure. We pray for repentance for them. Lord, bring healing. 
brings steadfast resolution for all of us to say, man, when people see me, they, they see Christ or they don't. May they always see him when they see us. In Jesus' name, amen. can come to you, that we can accept your grace, that we can, that you give it to us so freely. We pray, I pray that anybody here that has been touched, that knows that they are a sinner and that they should be exposed, would actually just come to you and to come to your throne of grace, ask forgiveness and to change their lives. Dear Lord, you are always forgiving and always loving. And dear Lord, as the Bible says, you are always faithful because you cannot be unfaithful to yourself. Dear Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to learn. We pray for upcoming Bible school and camps and things and CIYs, dear Lord, that our kids are um, going to be participating in. And dear Lord, I just pray that you will bless them and encourage them and help them to grow stronger in you and to be able to be approved workmen that need not be ashamed of the word of truth. We thank you for all this. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's fly away. <laughs> Since the fun. Is this the chorus? Oh, first the chorus. Okay. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to our home on God's celestial shore.
Gotcha.